Welcome to Tradition and Discovery. My name is Andy Steiger, and I'm with the Polani Society. You can learn more about this nonprofit organization at polanisociety.org. The website contains information and links to all sorts of resources, including Tradition and Discovery, the Polani Society Journal. Today, I have with me Martin Molesky joining us to discuss the life of Michael Polani. Thank you, Martin, for joining us all the way from Rome. It's a great pleasure. It's a thrill to be with you. You wrote uh, or co-wrote the biography of Michael Polanyi, uh, which I, I have here uh, in front of me. is a is a great book. You also did part of your <laughs> dissertation on Polanyi. I, I also have your book, per Personal uh, Catholicism. Nobody reads that. <laughs> I, I read it, man. Look, I we got I, we got a note here. <laughs> The Theological uh, Epistemologies of John Henry Newman and Michael Polanyi. Now, this came from your PhD dissertation. Exactly. Right? Yes. It, it's, it's a great book. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed reading it. Thank and you. I also really enjoyed reading uh, this biography. Now, you kind of got roped into this. This this wasn't something, this wasn't your initial project. This is something you kind of came into midway. Excuse yes. Me. Polanyi died in 1976. Bill Scott had met him in about 1963. Bill, a, an atmospheric physicist from University of Nevada at Reno, and uh, a religious man and interested in philosophy of science as well. And uh, the two of them hit it off. And uh, Bill and his wife went on sabbatical in Oxford and saw Michael and Magda all the time. So Bill uh, volunteered to do the biography in 1977 and worked on it till uh, 1994, essentially. Raised money, interviewed 150 people, wrote 293,000 words, <clears throat> delivered a magnificent talk. Uh, the title of it was At the Wheel of the World in 1991 at the Polanyi Centenary Conference in um, Kent State, Ohio. And I was just blown away by his presentation. Uh, it was my first Polanyi Society meeting. And I, like everybody else, was thrilled with the thought that the biography would be coming out any time now. And the years went by without the book appearing. And um, what happened was Bill was losing his faculties uh, for whatever reason, old age, some kind of Parkinsonism, maybe. I never heard an a authentic diagnosis. It just was true that after 1991, really, he could not write anymore. He could not write the last chapter of the book. He could not edit the book in response to criticisms that he received from readers. And he continued to deteriorate from 1991 to about 1995, 96, which is when his wife uh, nominated Phil Mullins to be the co-author. And Phil tried different things for about the space of a year and uh, couldn't make progress with the project. He was working full time. And I had a sabbatical coming up in 1997-98. And every chance I got, whenever the, the topic of uh, Bill needing help to finish the book, I would kind of say that I had 15 months free on the horizon, and I'd be happy to help any way I could. Now, I was uh, filled with ulterior motives. I wanted to find out if anybody had ever said to Michael Polanyi, do you know that your philosophy of science, your epistemology, really of personal knowledge, resembles that of John Henry Cardinal Newman, who died a year before Polanyi was born. The Cardinal died in 1890, Polanyi was born in 1891. And I was sure that somebody had to have said that to Polanyi 
and I couldn't understand why there is not one syllable about Newman in any of Polanyi's works. So that's why I wanted to become part of the project. So there was there was some motivation going on. Oh there. yeah, oh yeah. It's funny and, to me that uh, Phil Mullins, who who saw the breadth of the project that you were undertaking, that it was monumental. He he, in fact, said, you know, he quipped, you know, jokingly, that uh, that your work on this should qualify you for sainthood. He said. <laughs> <laughs> now you said something interesting in the preface that I I want to ask you about. Uh, anybody who's read this, I think you know, has this kind of question in the back of their mind, because you said the book placed before you is not the book that Bill wrote, nor is it the book that I would have written if I started fresh and worked on it alone. Yes. Nor is this the book that would have emerged from a true collaboration between two authors who could fight fairly with each other to archive a true union of thoughts. And I, and exactly. Well, when I read that, I had, I just, I couldn't help but but wonder, and I want to ask you, you know, if you had started this project afresh, you know, in, in what way would you have potentially approached it differently than what you inherited? Well, uh, Bill, as a physicist, was uh, very determined to represent all of Polanyi's accomplishments in science. And so in his version of the book, he, he, he had read every single scientific article that Polanyi wrote, and he did a very careful chronological study of all of his publications. And that's a lot more detail than I think is necessary <laughs> to uh, understand that Polanyi was a real scientist and a successful scientist and a brilliant teacher. And, 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 uh, uh, also a great humanist. So I would have put a lot less time, have put a lot less time into reading Polanyi's science. And uh, I'm attracted more to his philosophy and theology. So I, I, I tried to preserve Bill's story, but I had to abridge it drastically. Could you tell me, tell me a little bit about that? Now, you you are um, a Jesuit, if I if I remember I correctly. Yes. Uh, so so of course you've got a theological uh, interest. T- tell me how you first came across Polanyi that first sparked an interest in in his writings. I was a uh, second year student at Boston College, majoring in English, and I wrote an essay. Uh, a proof for the existence of God for my philosophy theology seminar. And my effort was to use the act of the reader objecting to something I said in the paper and then arguing from that data, the act of objecting to something that he understood in my paper to show that there was a God. I, I thought it was a very clever paper. And uh, I showed it to my uh, atheist Jewish English mentor uh, and uh, he read it he didn't say anything about the argument but uh, he said you should read Michael Polanyi you would like his work that was in 1972 and he got me to read uh, the tacit dimension and personal knowledge and uh, Marjorie Green's book, I think it's uh, Knowing and Being, uh, the collection of essays, and uh, uh, her portrait of Aristotle, and uh, that's how I got started. Well, we're, we're already starting to jump into his life and thought, so let's, let's yeah. rewind all the way back to, to the beginning. Not, you know, Maybe I guess we could just mention, you know, he's born on March 11th, 1891, which was kind of interesting because you and I had been discussing doing this uh, <laughs> interview right out on his birthday. You're like, oh, yeah. don't you this is yeah. right on his birthday. And by the way, this is just a side note, but I thought this was just an interesting tidbit. As was mentioned in this uh, biography, uh, this was uh, William Scott and, and, and yourself that co-wrote. It was interesting to me just again just some interesting an interesting fact that William Scott actually died on the same 
date is Michael. Yes, Jordan. February twenty second, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I that gives me chills. Yeah, it, it, it really does. Uh, <laughs> now it's just synchronicity. You know, it could be pure coincidence. Yeah, but I but it, 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 it <sighs> but, caught me. It caught me to her. I just you just can't help but just thought you know stop and just ponder it for a moment. But let, yep. let's jump into yep. Polanyi's life. Uh, you know, tell me, tell me about his his early upbringing, being born in in Budapest in in Hungary, and ultimately what what drives him into to science, and, and we'll kind of develop it from there. Yeah, his his father was uh, a railroad engineer. Uh, he had a, a grandfather who was a rabbi, uh, a practicing rabbi. His father was, you could say, scientific, but not religious. And his mother, also Jewish, was not observant. Uh, nobody in the family attended, other than the grandfather, of course. But the Polanyi's immediate family did not attend shul and um, didn't think of themselves as religious Jews. Uh, so Polanyi, when he went to school, uh, was interested in everything. Uh, he studied languages, poetry, and uh, science. And when he graduated, he wanted to get the best scientific education that he could in Budapest, which was in the medical school. So he uh, obtained a degree as a medical doctor and uh, worked on colloid chemistry. Uh, colloids are like neither fish nor, nor fowl. They're not solids, liquids, or gases. They're aggregates of things in different states. Uh, I think jello is probably a colloid. And uh, this is extremely important in the body, in the life of cells. So much of where life happens in the body is in colloids. And uh, they say that he did good work on colloid chemistry first. That's where he started. And then he was drafted as a doctor into the uh, Austro-Hungarian army in World War I, got sick. And while he was in the hospital, he came up with the theory of the adsorption of gases. And adsorption is a phenomenon that takes place between any two dissimilar surfaces. Now, it happens that the easiest thing to study is the adsorption, the attachment of gas molecules to uh, a surface like carbon. As a vast surface area, carbon is very reactive. And it's, it's, it's possible to measure, or it became possible over the years to measure, how many molecules from a gas would stick to the surface of carbon. And uh, at the time that Polanyi developed his theory that there was an inverse uh, third power law at work, that the adsorptive strength of the bond increased very dramatically with the closeness of a molecule to the surface. Uh, at that time, they weren't able to tell how many layers of molecules there were. He, he theorized on the basis of this attractive force which caused the, caused the attachment, uh, the concentration of atoms from the air on the surface of the carbon. He theorized that it could be any number of layers thick and that the uh, intensity of the concentration would diminish very rapidly with distance. And uh, he, he, he arrived at this conclusion by reading other people's research. He didn't invent any experiments. He didn't do any new research himself. He just read articles about- Which, which he was actually doing in the hospital, like <laughs> yeah. as he's you know, recovering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he just saw something that tweaked his interests and he wrote it up. And that became the foundation of his doctorate in physical chemistry which he entered in, into training for, went to school for in uh, the years after the First World War because he decided he wanted to be a physical chemist. 
Now, let's just pause there for a moment, because I think there's an important thing, you know, that's happening here. On the one hand, we see that, you know, he he starts out as this medical doctor and, you know, while he's healing in the hospital, he starts heading towards, you know, physical chemistry and ultimately does, you know, his PhD in that. But one of the things that's interesting that you highlight in the book and, and I think is just significant to appreciate his work in general is that Polanyi isn't all mind, he's mind and heart. The, the war, World War I, and as, well, as we get farther along, World War II, they had a profound impact on him, particularly the evils that he witnessed that would really begin to take root in him and, and come out, not, you know, in his, in, in, not only in the way that he saw science, but ultimately that what's going to direct him and kind of, lead him into philosophy yes yes he, he came from a thinking family they called his uh, mother his the mother of the uh, hungarian revolution she was a socialist his older brother was a socialist the people who came to her soirees were socialists and so polanyi was thinking along socio-political economic lines from his boyhood really and uh, uh, he was a man of Europe. He spoke and read many languages. In one of his letters, he, he talks about how he read a letter and started talking about it with his son. And uh, as he was talking with, with his son, he couldn't remember what language he had read the letter in. It was just so natural for him to read any language and understand it and just deal with the ideas. So he was primed for philosophy before he went to medicine and before he went into the physical science, the physical chemistry. Now, let's continue into this physical chemistry because it's interesting that his career almost comes to an abrupt halt uh, right, at the, <laughs> right at the beginning when he gained yes. the attention of, of Haber and Einstein, but not for the better. Uh, they actually oppose him. Yes. He had done well enough that he was hired to work in the Fiber Institute. And um, this was close to what he wanted to work on. Uh, his dream was to deal with uh, reaction rates in chemistry, reaction kinetics, the way in which energy is transferred and released in, to cause chemical reactions and coming out of chemical reactions. And he couldn't get into that area immediately. And... Uh, he, so he was assigned to the Fiber Institute, uh, which dealt with molecular uh, structures, crystalline structures, and the strength of bonds in uh, metals. And uh, there were weekly, I think there were weekly seminars in Berlin with, with all the greats, you know. So he was there with Einstein and uh, Mach and... Um, Schrodinger and you know the, the, the people who just uh, were, were later on not not in 19, the early 1920s but when quantum phenomena were discovered uh, Einstein of course was already well established but uh, you know the people who discovered the peculiarities of atomic reactions and uh, quantum phenomena they were all there the greats and when he presented his theory of adsorption that there was some attractive force electrostatic force between the two dissimilar uh, compounds materials uh, and that he thought it could uh, possibly cause a concentration of many many different layers of molecules trailing off you know until you reach the uh, equilibrium and the center of the other mass the Einstein and the other great, great physicists said your theory doesn't make any sense because they thought that electrons were perfectly mobile, that they could go anywhere in response to uh, positive and negative charges and reach equilibrium very quickly and so uh, prevent the buildup of a static attraction that would be more than one layer of molecules thick. And uh, Polanyi had no answer to that. If, 
if the electrons were perfectly mobile, uh, then the physicists were correct that equilibrium would be reached, reached with the very first layer of the, uh, with the con first contact between the two layers. And there wouldn't be a broad uh, attractive force acting outside of that. It would all be shielded by the first layer. It wasn't until Pauli discovered the exclusion principle which says, and, and it's, it's a quantum reality, which says that electrons are not perfectly mobile in the structure of atoms and molecules, but they can only occupy certain shells and no two electrons can have the same um, quantum number, the same description of, it, of its charge and its spin. Uh, so this, Oh, 10 years later was used by Fritz London to explain the um, why light reflects at an angle off of surfaces. And uh, uh, London's law of the uh, electrical, electrostatic uh, field at the surface that the light strikes is an inverse third power law. And uh, he and Polanyi worked together to show that the reality of quantum limitations, electrons don't go anywhere. They move in these jumps from one shell to the next. And, and the uh, phenomenon of uh, the interaction of the two different kinds of material with respect to their own structure explains not only the way that light bounces off a surface, but is in fact a verification of Polanyi's theory of adsorption. So, so the was, multiple multiple layers. So he was were ultimately right. shown that he was yeah. correct. Yes, yes, it's yes. Truly, truly uh, astonishing, you know, like, but I mean, it, it, perhaps it shouldn't be astonishing in that he was a first rate scientist and would ultimately be uh, welcomed into the the royal society he oh yes oh yes and th that was after the the work with london of course yeah. but he he was able working with uh crystal structures uh, he he did some remarkable things there coming up with the first explanation of why crystals were so easy to fracture when it seemed as though every bond in them should be a full strength uh, molecular bond. And you could calculate how much force it would take to break these innumerable mole molecular bonds in a crystal. And uh, Polanyi came up with the idea that there was just a little, you only, you only had to break one bond and then there would be this cascade as, as the crystals began to move the area of weakness would just, just sort of like roll along like a log between two rocks, you know, being rolled into place in the pyramid. And uh, this, this little deformation, this crystal deformation uh, explained why things composed of such strong molecular bonds could be fractured along these crystalline lines. So that was a great discovery. And then he worked with the rotating crystal method and, and this got him into the really uh, the heart of future chemistry. By shining x-rays on uh, crystals, the x-rays diffract at a certain angle and you can see where the waves of light coming out of the crystal interact with each other, creating areas of light and dark just on a photographic plate. And these were very regular patterns. And uh, Polanyi helped to develop the rotating crystal method where you'd rotate the crystal in a uh, field of X-rays and have a, a photographic paper collect the patterns. And then once you had these patterns, these interference patterns of light and darkness, you, you could say, well, 
what is it about the structure of the crystal that's causing the X-rays to refract in this orderly fashion, producing these regular patterns of light and darkness? And they were able to decode the structure of cellulose, the, the structure of a part of the cellulose molecule. And, and Polanyi came this close to figuring out that it was a polymer uh, from, from the evidence that they had, from the materials that they had to work with, the uh, kind of equipment that they could use for recording the diffraction patterns. They were only able to see a fragment of the entire long molecule. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the thought that molecules could be indefinitely long chains of repetitive patterns had not been established. And so Polanyi says, well, we didn't know whether it was a big molecule or a little molecule. So we, we published it as if that was all there was to it, but, but it was only one building block of cellulose. And where this turns up again, very, very dramatically is in the structure of DNA. And, and the uh, rotating crystal method, the method of uh, interpreting interference patterns that come out of X-rays hitting a crystal is what was used to decode DNA in 1953. So Polanyi was working on techniques that 30 years later revealed the structure of DNA. Wow. It's just amazing. Yeah, that, that really is amazing. I, I really appreciate, you know, this, this information because there's a lot of people who jump into Polanyi and they don't take the time to appreciate his scientific, you know, work, which is in, which is, which I think is a detriment because when you start reading his writings, you'll see that as he interacts with philosophy, he will come back to these different scientific insights that he'll use as illustrations for how he's processing philosophical yes, concepts yes, and arguments. Yes. Now, I want to fast forward as we're continuing to move in this, this timeline of his life, because we, we move in this, this period where he's doing all of this top, top notch scientific work in Berlin when Hitler comes to power in Germany. And this, this then you know, brings his scientific work really to a halt. And he starts to really start to, he begins to transition out of science. It's going to be a part of that, that transition. Walk me through that. What, like, what happens and where does he go as he flees uh, um, Hitler's, you know, the, the, the Nazi regime? Well, you know who's far better at this than Bill and I were is Mary Jo Nye. Yeah, she has, uh, she has, she's done some great work. Her book is superb, and it made me weep when I read it because uh, people have been trying to get her to fix the biography, and uh, it would have been a vastly better book if she had been able to do it. Uh, She's a, a historian of science. She has a, a feel for the culture in which Polanyi lived, the whole world, the whole story of anti-Semitic uh, hostility in Hungary and in Berlin and the buildup to the Nazi period. Uh, she, she understands it and, and she explains it uh, at every level, every level. You know, yeah, she does a it, good job also of like of showing you know what laws came into effect and how those yes, impacted particularly yes. the career that Polanyi was in and yeah, yes I, yeah. I agree I would I would really yes. encourage people to take a take a look at her work absolutely you, 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 the, the Scott Molesky biography is just a a, a a start and it has there are many defects in it <laughs> and she. I, I think did a vastly better job than, than I ever could. And then Bill was able to do, Bill tried, Bill tried to, you know, his, some of his early chapters really worked hard to try to evoke the culture uh, in which Polanyi lived, the divided culture. Now, now this is, I think is an important 
point in his history because he he flees from Berlin. He goes to Manchester in in the UK and he begins yep. to work at, at the university there. But I want to highlight something that my own doctoral work uh I, I feel like brought to light that I thought was kind of missing. Now, in your biography, you guys do address Polanyi's critique of evolution, which brought a lot of tension. But one of the things I found that that I just see missing by and large from from Polanyi, you know, people who are looking and not trying to understand Polanyi, is, is that I don't think that they fully appreciate why. I don't think they fully appreciate the moral aspect of his critique of neo-Darwinism, to be specific. And particularly, I would argue, because he sees how it ultimately leads to, to this, uh, you know, Holocaust that's taking place before his eyes, or devaluing of people, and ultimately costs the life of his, of his sister and her husband and their, and their son. Uh, during yes. that war, and I, you, yes. I mean, his own family died in that. You can't, and I, people don't bring that up a lot. Like that's going to impact you. That's going to change the way you see things. Yeah, uh, I found it very strange that uh, there was practically not a syllable in anything that I've read that's public from Polanyi or private from the archives in Chicago. I was able to read some family archives in Toronto. Uh, Polanyi did not talk a great deal about his contempt for Hitler, Nazism, the persecution of Jews. In fact, no, the strangest thing is uh, there are many letters and many positions that he took in the World War II where he says, I'm a Jew for the purposes of persecution. My name is on a hit list of the Nazis. If they had taken over England, they would have come after me. Uh, but when he was asked to join Jewish groups who were protesting the war, uh, this would be in the early 1940s, early part of the war, he said, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Jew. And he, he refused to... Um, work with those uh, organizations by, you know, where he would have been thought of as acting as a Jew instead of as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And um, he's kind of adamant about that, you know, wrote, wrote some uh, papers on the position of Jews in Europe. He does critique Zionism as well. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Arthur Kessler was a friend of his uh, in later life, and Kester was a Zionist, and there are remarks that he makes to Kester about his Zionism. Uh, so, uh, and 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 the the sorrow he may have felt, must have felt, about his sister and other members of his family dying in the concentration camps, he doesn't express it. I should say, I have not seen any expressions along those lines of you know, being heartbroken. There is a, a very interesting letter, a fragment of a letter that Olive Davies saved. She was uh, one of his secretaries, uh, the one in, at the, uh, maybe the most important part of his philosophical career, you know, the 1948 to 1956. And, uh, she saves this, uh, typed out a copy of the letter that he was writing to somebody. And she doesn't, she didn't write down who it was or what the date was. But in that letter, uh, Polanyi does express his contempt for Hitler and for all of the people whose philosophies resemble Hitler's. And I he's saying- I shared to, that actually in a Polanyi Society meeting. You did a lecture. I did. I did. Yeah, I have yeah. that quote. It's a, it's a very powerful quote. And I think I, I must have uh, published, it, you know, after that lecture, I, I probably put it in the article for Tad, so it can be found. But that, that letter was in Bill's files and didn't make it into the book. Like, when, when I found that, I was just aghast. <laughs> how, how, could he, how could he have left out such 
powerful writing. Okay, there are problems with it. The provenance is just, uh, Olive Davies said this was Polanyi's writing, but she could not have written it herself. It, it's an authentic letter from Michael Polanyi. It, it, it's unfortunate we don't know who he was talking to. But the clear condemnation of the objectivist philosophies that destroy human beings, that is just crystal clear. And, and I would have put that at the center of a chapter or you know, a section of a chapter, because it to me it just goes right to the heart of the matter. Let me, I'll read for you a, a letter that does come out of his unpublished works called Science and Man. Uh, you can find this in box 41, folder four. He says, all modern revolutionary movements, even that of Hitler had inspired idealistic followers and could not have triumphed without them. But the idealism of these followers was embodied by ice cold violence for their modern scientific skepticism had taught them to desire liberalism and humanitarian ideals as frauds trusted only by fools. Nietzsche faced the facts that the scientific outlook had no place for moral values and declared that our fearless rejection of all established values was itself our own supreme value. Yes. Now, it, I think it's in personal knowledge that he calls this a moral inversion. Right, a moral inversion. It's in, in that moral component that you'll you hear, yeah. you know, a lot yeah. of people are like, man, should Polanyi be viewed as a moral philosopher? I, I know you'll encounter certain people that are unsure what to do because you're right, because of moral inversion and just and just with how passionately he speaks out against what he witnessed. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so if people have said at Polanyi Society meetings that this is one theme of Polanyi's that's underdeveloped among us, that we have not picked it up and applied it to our own uh, society today. But I, and I think of that, and I've never written about it, but I think of it so often. The moral outrage that is disconnected from any foundation for morality mm. uh, where there is this uh, appeal to science science is in and of itself uh a moral and, and polani sees this and, and i think this is good transition as we continue and what really grabs his attention as he reaches manchester as he's seeing that the ideas that are going on you know, where, where he just, you know, he fled and where he's witnessing what's happening in Germany, he's witnessing what's going on in Russia. And here he finds it's going on even in the UK as is he experiences scientific planning committees. Oh, and, yes. And as you say that, you know, it is amoral, amoral. And so you get these people going, well, we should just tell scientists what they should do, what they should study and what will be good for society. And, or, or the scientists should tell us. I mean, that that's, it's a... Right. It could go either way. It can go either way because there is no center. There's no, no framework or interpretative framework, I think is what Paul Polanyi calls it, of, of overarching values. When you give up the idea of truth and all of the metaphysical burdens that come with that, well, who cares what's true? Tell the scientists what to, oh, that, 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 that was what he hated about the Soviet Union. I was just going to say his conversations yeah. with Nikolai Bukharin. He, exactly. He's going, what, what are you guys doing over there? And then for him, I believe where things really get serious is when he sees what happens between Vavlov and Lysenko. Exactly. That ultimately leads exactly. to Vavlov being put in prison in which he yeah. died. Yeah. Polanyi tried so hard to organize a rescue for him. You know, to, to, to move other scientists to protest this. And it, it all came to naught. Of course, uh, they were up against the Soviet Union. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it may be that even if every scientist that he solicited had agreed with him wholeheartedly. But Vavlov was a first rate scientist. I mean, he was doing incredible, yeah. incredible work. Yeah. But but yeah. but his science didn't align with, you know, Stalin's political agenda. No, Stalin said you must discover, <laughs> prove that 
uh, developed characteristics can be inherited. So if somebody goes and works out as a bodybuilder and they acquire huge muscles, their children should be born muscular. That, that's what he told the biologists to prove. Well, that's, we, we, know, we know that's completely and utterly false. But that was that was the mentality, and, and the mentality of the, the the rhetoric of the Soviet Union was, we are a science based society. Well, they had no idea what science was. It well, was this is this is a good this is a good question that we need to really unpack because, I think, this began, you know, to challenge Polanyi to think about okay, what actually is science? Because a lot of people are embracing even to this day. And I, an idea of what science is that, that's actually very untenable. That, that Polanyi, I, I think, will surprise a lot of people who haven't read him that he has a very loose definition of science. I don't, I'm not aware of him giving a definition. Yeah, it, perhaps that <laughs> Oh, no, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. I have one. I have one. Uh, he said scientific knowing consists of discerning gestalten patterns in nature. That's, that's the best, and, 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 and believe me, I've looked for definitions from Polanyi. I mean, in my, in my doctoral work and in my years since, and trying to teach students a little bit about him. That's the definition that I use from him. And, and it's a, it, it fits perfectly, of course, with personal knowledge. And, and I think and, it, it does. And, it, and I think one of the things he's really pushing against is this idea that science can be mechanized. And you know, he often will point to Copernicus, but particularly Einstein, and saying, look, like it's not like he did some sort of scientific method to come up with relativity. He just he thought about it. it which is okay. Einstein did on a much grander scale what Polanyi did in the hospital bed. Right. All that the two of them did was to reorganize what other people had already discovered. Einstein didn't do any experiments. He thought about the meaning of the speed of light and light as an electromagnetic uh, wave or phenomenon and uh, as something that was an absolute. And then he thought about how everything is relative to the speed of light in a vacuum. It's the, the measuring stick that we can use, the only measuring stick that we can use to draw up all of the other relationships between um, frameworks, you know, of motion, you know, motion within a particular space and time, part of space and time. Well, that's all he did was think. And the uh, same thing with the uh, particle wave nature of light. That's what he got the um, Nobel Prize for, you know, it was just... <laughs> work on light not relativity that the the academy honored now, now this is an important concept to appreciate if you want to understand kind of the genesis of Polanyi's philosophy because what what he sees happening in the USSR particularly in his conversations with Bukharin as he's seen that the you have these two different sciences you have pure science and applied science and in Social, this socialism that was happening, this communism that was taking place, it was placing applied science or what Polanyi calls social determinism over pure science. But then what he sees is this transition taking place in which you have pure science or physical determinism that now comes to reign over applied science within what, what ultimately Polanyi would refer to as uh, objectivism. Now, I know there's a lot there, but let's let's begin to unpack that because ultimately this is what's going to lead Polanyi to saying, listen, philosophy should be based on personal knowledge, not impersonal knowledge. Now, let's well, unpack that a bit. Okay, okay. So his slogan is all knowing is either tacit or rooted in tacit knowing. That that's not just philosophy. That's physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, logic, uh, art, literature, uh, rhetoric, 
what, 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 computer science. It, it, it covers every, it, it, it's a sweeping generalization. All knowledge has a personal structure. There is no, a nor in the known. That was Marjorie Green's book. Um, uh, there's no knowing without a knower. That's right. And the mind of the knower acts on the information given from outside of us, the objective order, and reorganizes that information into ideas and theories and concepts and interpretative frameworks that add meaning to just the objective observations. That's the heart of philosophy and science and mathematics and physics and chemistry and biology, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole shooting match. All knowledge is personal knowledge because it is a person who knows and their knowing can never be strictly formalized or mechanized or reduced to, you know, computerized operations. And this is, this is where Polanyi gets concerned about pure science because he's basically arguing that if your philosophy is not careful, you, the, your science will kill the scientist. Absolutely. The, the objectivist philosophies leave out the contribution of the mind of the scientist. And As if there were plenty saying it's both. You got to have both. But you, I think, yeah, I think he would argue <laughs> if you're going to place any ontological weight or weight more one over the other, you should weight the person because yes. there, yes. there is there is a, a flow to the way knowledge works. It, it, you know, it's it's scientists that do science. It's not science that does, you know, exactly. creates the scientist. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, it, you are, you're totally right. His weight, his emphasis is on the personal, informal, tacit, spontaneous powers of the mind. Our, our minds generate uh, new gestalts, new interpretations, gestalt shift, right? Yeah. Uh, we identify our, patterns. Yeah. Now, we can be misled. We can see a man in the moon. Uh, <laughs> scientists thought that they were observing canals on Mars that came and went. And that was, that was for many, many, many decades. And they were writing these, these solemn articles about Martian agriculture and how well they, how quickly they could build their canals in the rainy season or some darn thing. And when the optics got better, all of that disappeared. So, so our powers of interpretation, our powers of seeing patterns can lead us astray. So we don't want to be uncritical, uh, but neither can we invest any machinery with our critical uh, apparatus, the, the, our ability to say, oh, I've made a mistake and here's where I went wrong. Or more often, you've made a mistake and here's where you went wrong. Let, let's you know? highlight that for a second, because ultimately, when you read Polanyi's philosophy, one of the one of the major concerns he has with this objectivism is that it has no place for the mind. It has no place for the knower, for the for the scientist. And 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 Polanyi interacts with this right away when he comes to Manchester, because teaching at the university at the same time is Alan Turing. And, and this is when Polanyi begins, his, his own thinking is being challenged by the question, well, can thinking be mechanized? Can, can you create, you know, these machines that we would come to know as computers or artificial intelligence? But man, he's right there at, at the beginning of those conversations. With yeah, like well, Kirk. he had his uh, philosophy of science the, the, the seeds of his fundamental insights into tacit knowing personal knowledge in the 1930s. And now I can't remember if this uh, was published in the biography or if it's one of these things that I tried to work into an article later on. It's a letter to the editor from about 1937, I think, a uh, letter to... Um, uh, 
journal in chemistry, I think. It's called, and I, I call it uh, the value of the inexact. Okay. I, I'm not finding it just now. So I may have my dates wrong. But in this <laughs> letter, speaking as a practicing uh, chemist, Polanyi says, all of those people who try to come up with precise formal laws from the world of physics to explain chemistry have no idea of how important it is that we deal with inexact chemical reactions this is a good point because let's just highlight this real fast. yeah yeah if you're reading michael polani's work you might you might be confused why he will always conjoin physics and chemistry he mm -hmm. he he's he's doing this very much to to give you this idea that he one of his you know clear arguments is that chemistry is is not uh is not exact like it that this that's is, it. That's it. That's it. it yeah. And you have and you have to live with that. Yeah. <laughs> Th that's that's a fact. None of the chemicals you use are pure. They all ha have traces of every element in the periodic table in them. <laughs> and all you can do is reduce them, get them down to a level of impurity that you can deal with. And no chemical reaction i'm i'm I, some chemist will want to correct me i'm sure but i don't think there's any chemical reaction that produces a hundred percent pure products it'll be 70 80 90 percent you'll get what you're looking for out of the reaction and then there'll be these bizarre other uh in, intermediate compounds that just didn't get the right it didn't hit the right object at the right time didn't have the right energy to enter into the desired reaction. And you just, that's life in, in the chemistry lab. <laughs> you always got some residue at the bottom of your test tube. And, and if, you, if you try to stop and figure out, well, what, what's that residue today? You'll go nuts and you won't get any chemistry done. Okay, so I found the, I found the references, 1936, letter to the editor. Uh, Philosophy of Science was the name of the journal, and it's just a single page, and it's reprinted in Tradition of Discovery 18, 1992, 35 to 36. So it did not make it into the biography. And uh, what, what is, what, what did, I said 1936. He's on the track to the tacit knowing of a chemist that makes being a chemist possible. The wise ignorance of discrepancies, setting aside things that are unexpected, but that you judge personally, sorry, probably hit my microphone again, don't matter. Some differences make no difference. And you have to neglect strange things that happen and follow the main line that you're researching. Now, once in a while, one of those oddities will turn out to be very revealing. So you don't wanna be, you know, too rigorous about this vagueness and neglect of inconsistencies, but it's a matter of, of, uh, of performing to self-set standards personal appraisal. There's a Polanyi journal in uh, Britain called appraisal. And it's the essential act by which the intellect guards itself against false judgments. When we, we continually are asking ourselves, is this right? Do I have the evidence? Will, is this the right language to make this clear to another person? Is this, is this the proper expression? And we're, we're constantly uh, caring about in ourselves ideals that we strive to achieve personal self-set standards of excellence. So among our standards has to be the ability to roll with the punches when things, chemicals are not pure and there's some residue in our test tube that we didn't expect. Yeah. So you could see 
how this is going to start to develop this philosophy. That's, yes. That's going to want to go against this objectivism desire for a very pure, you know, reductive view of, of life, right? Rigorous. All mathematical. Yeah. <laughs> you know? With, which is interesting because at that time, you know, you're seeing different research that's coming out, um, such as Gödel's incompleteness theorem that, that Polanyi references numerous times. Yes. Where he wants to say, look, you can even see this in mathematics that, you know, you need this, uh, you need somebody outside the system. The system's not complete in and of itself. Well, the system, uh, okay, the judgment that there are undecidable propositions in any formal system of logic that's capable of asking the question, am I, this system, consistent and complete? The judgment that there are undecidable propositions within any symbolic system of that strength is a judgment of a person. It's, it's done by inspection of the Gerdelian proposition and the, and the, 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 the uh, insoluble paradox is a sentence which says in the language, in the formal language, this system cannot decide whether this proposition is true or false. I believe he yes. calls this the Gardelian sen sentence. Right? It is, it is, it is. And there's a whole book, Gödel, Escher, and Bach, you know, which uh, introduces this uh, logic, which blows up the project of proving everything. Uh, I highly recommend it if, you know, for anybody who's interested in Gödel. I, I tell you, there's a part of me, you know, the philosopher in me wants to just stay here and I want to just keep talking about this because it's <laughs> well, yeah. so much to mine. We'll have to yeah. come back on another conversation to mine this because I know you have interest in computer science and stuff. So yeah, yeah. This is what I mean. If I had written the book, it'd be different. <laughs> and, 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 and if Bill had been around to argue with me, it would have been different. Right. You know, everybody's but, got their interests, right? And you want to just go deeper in that, yeah, one, that one area. So yeah. let, let's move on. You know, as we as we come in, you know, towards a landing here, uh, because Polanyi's going to move out of his science and he's going to transition into philosophy, which yeah, which is very unique, isn't it? I mean, late in his life, he's in his fifties and he's making this huge, you know, uh, professional. No, he was, okay, 1948, he was, yeah, okay, he was 57. Yeah, like he was in his late 50s. Yeah, late 50s. Right? <laughs> but, but he, uh, all through World War II, I mean, this, this didn't come out of nowhere. So right. he took as his project, his wartime project, to write about the philosophy of freedom. And it was... Uh, Notice again how the war and everything is really challenging his thinking, right? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And it's a war of ideas that the bad philosophies of science contributed both to Nazism and then to the USSR. And uh, he's taught, he, he's in, in, in many, many unpublished manuscripts from those years, you know, but he's, he's interested in free trade and full employment that came out of this wartime work. You can and read then, the book Logic and Liberty to get- Logic and Liberty, that's, that, that came out of this. Yeah. And Science, Faith and Society came out of this. Yeah. You know, so those are the three post-war books uh, that he produced from, all, from drafting all kinds of, trying different ways to think about freedom of, inquiry, freedom of research, freedom of the mind uh, in, in all walks of life, freedom in the uh, political realm, freedom in the economic realm, you know, that, that this is a prime value for him, uh, that, that he was thinking about philosophically. Do you know one thing that I find interesting about Polanyi 
is he he makes this transition into philosophy from science and and as we know people like marjorie green and others would come alongside him and kind of help him as he's not schooled in philosophy but i actually think that's part of his strength is that he did too he has an ability to see things from a fresh perspective yeah yeah that's that's how he operated all of his life he was a medical doctor what's he doing research on colloid chemistry for that's not something that medical doctors ordinarily do and then as a medical doctor he starts reading about adsorption of gases and it intrigues him and he says well this this is how it looks to me and then he goes to study physical chemistry with the heart of his <laughs> thesis in hand already he, before he was trained right yeah and then he jumped into economics because of arguments with his family studying soviet economics to show that it was really capitalism in disguise and then uh Yes, turning to the philosophy of freedom, freedom uh, in the economic and the social realm and in uh, uh, scientific research, freedom he was from a true planning. Holy math, wasn't he? he was. And then jumping into theology and late in life getting into some theories of aesthetics that just totally leave me cold. But uh, I'm going to have to agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with you there. I can't help but feel like he lost himself a bit when he went into when he delved into those waters. Yeah, but 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 that's that's how his mind worked. Yeah, he was interested really in almost everything. Now, now I think it's important for people that want to know about his life that that his transition into philosophy really takes root uh, when he's invited to give the Gifford lectures. <sighs> And I find this fascinating that he's invited to give these lectures, uh, Marty, because these lectures are, are of a theological tone. These are natural, these are lectures in natural theology. So I find it interesting that they, that they pinpointed Polanyi to give those lectures. What's your thoughts there? Well, first of all, just last night, I read a, the manuscript of an article that's going to be published in a collection of essays on science, faith, and society. And I'm sorry, I don't know the author's name. <laughs> I read the article with great interest because he shows that the roots of Polanyi's philosophical skills lie in those years in Manchester before 1948. He was friends with Dorothy Emmett, who was chair of the philosophy department, and he talked philosophy with her and had her read some of the things that he was writing during the war. And she encouraged him and helped him and guided him. So, again, the, the turn in 1948 didn't come out of nowhere. It, it, it had roots in a relationship with a friend, a well-educated, very thoughtful, very sharp friend. Uh, and watch for that book on uh, collected essays on uh, science, faith, and society. Look for the one on metaphysics and Dorothy Emmett. Really excellent. Then, so uh, in Science, Faith, and Society, Polanyi talks about the conscience of a scientist. And the, uh, uh, really, he's, again, he's got his epistemology in its germ. And it is, uh, an appealing philosophy of science because he is not following the standard objectivist division between science, which is knowledge, and religion, philosophy, aesthetics, literature, history, psychology, you name it, economics, which are just matters of opinion. No, Polanyi, in science, faith, and society is saying that we have to have faith in science. The foundation of science is no more secure than the foundation of faith in uh, a revealing God or faith in uh, the instruments that you use to conduct experiments or yeah, faith, faith in reason. 
Christine, <laughs> I, I, um, I define faith as trusting what you have good reason to believe is true. Yes. Oh, well, reason, as long as we don't have a, an objectivist, mechanist, formalist definition of reason. Right, right. right? But ultimately, okay. what you're doing is weighing evidence yes. and you're making that, a decision. That's appraisal. Yeah. Your, 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 your intellect, intellectual powers are governed by performing to self-set standards of what is and is not reasonable. And, and we don't have a clear and distinct definition of what reason is. We don't have a clear and distinct definition of what logic is, or proof, or evidence, or science. Uh, uh, we don't have a clear and distinct definition of what a clear and distinct definition is. <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> but we have informal powers of reasoning that come first. They are what gave us the ability to speak. All children are scientists. They're collecting evidence and weighing up things and forming hypotheses. And one day they say, mama, and mean it. Right. And I think what ultimately you see then is this idea, like it's a push against what often in culture is embraced as like a blind faith idea that it's just this kind of pie in the sky or hopeful thinking or whatever it might be. Oh, right, right. No, 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 no. Yeah, Polanyi, he presented himself as a Christian. Oh, ah, and part of the, part of the, the religious background, uh, you have to look at Phil Mullins for this. It's another part of the book, the, the, the biography, just brushes over. Was Polanyi's participation, again, beginning in the war years, in the moot, right. where he met T.S. Eliot, and it was led by the Reverend something, something Oldham, John uh, Oldham, 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 yeah, and uh, he, he he met many Christian intellectuals in that environment, and jo Joseph Oldham, yeah, Joseph, Joseph, and uh, uh, that was a a group that had it leavened leavened a lot of people who then went out and wrote about religion and culture. So Polanyi had standing within that group and letters between him and T.S. Eliot. There's you know, a, a great book, by the way, if people are interested to go deeper in this by Keith Clements called The Moot Papers. That, oh. that really unpacks a lot of the different people in that group and Polanyi's yes. participation. Yes. I, I do think it is interesting, by the way, just a little side fact. Uh, Polanyi actually dedicated his book, The Study of Man, to Oldham, uh, which yeah, is, which oh, and he tells he, you he, the significance he had on his life. True, true, and uh, he thanked him, oh, uh, you know, from his heart for the help that he gave him uh, in bringing the, the book to a conclusion. The first edition of Science, Faith, and Society, the book that led to the uh, lectures, that led to personal knowledge, that led to the tacit dimension that led to our talk today <laughs> was dedicated to Dorothy Emmett, mm. but just, just her initials to DME. That's all it said. And it was removed in later editions. Magda, I think was a little upset that the book was dedicated to Dorothy rather than to her. She, she felt that she was a dialogue partner of Polanyi's and that she contributed to the work that he did. When you read so, um, Magda's letters, it's particularly back and forth between her and Prosh. Yeah. He, he states that quite clearly that she sees herself as a as a dialogue partner. As, yeah. Yeah. So I could yeah. I could definitely I could I could see that. I I think though um, it, one thing I want to just highlight real quick here that I think, yeah you know because I know anybody watching this is going to push back on. <laughs> one of the things there. Uh, and so I have to do my due diligence to push back on this idea that Polanyi was a Christian or ah. Christian or what what level he was, because as you know, there is a lot of debate over this. Yeah, yeah. And there again, okay. He said he was a Christian. <laughs> no. Uh, I, uh, would you, I, say, I would, though, would you I, say to be fair though it almost seems at times he'll say he's a christian 
Of course. But the, that's lots of Christians do that. Yeah. St. Peter waffled, right? He went back and forth. <laughs> when Jesus needed him the most, he said, I, I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, yes, this, this is something that uh, interested me from the time I, I read Polanyi because I'd written a paper on the proof of the existence of God. I kept on reading Polanyi because I saw that to my mind, his way of thinking about order and the works of intelligence contrasted with random events meant that there has to be an intelligence behind the universe. That's what it meant to me. I see a complete apologetic for the existence of God in Polanyi's philosophy. He did not. And I'm sorry, who uh, he didn't? Polanyi did not. Okay. He did not. He did not. Oh, and, and, and this is the paradox of the Gifford lectures. I see. You're saying you saw it, but you. I know. saw it in his philosophy. That's one. Of, that's why my teacher said you'll like him, hmm. because on a, on a superficial reading, he seems to be pointing directly toward a god behind evolution, a god who creates a, a force field. The uh, what, is, what does Polanyi call it? Well, he quotes Teilhard de Jardin. Well, Teilhard, he's hardly a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> can I quote you on that? <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> but he, he was a Jesuit who died in my province in New York City, and I visited his grave when I was a boy. And I've met people who love him, love him dearly. So he said he was a Christian. A Catholic. All right, same thing with Polanyi. Polanyi is not my kind of Christian. Polanyi is not really completely my kind of philosopher. I want to grow up to be a Thomist someday, mm. any day now. <laughs> and uh, I, it was part of my work on my doctorate. Uh, I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to show that you can use Polanyi to prove that there is a God. And uh, if there's a God, then Christianity becomes much more credible because it would be established on philosophical grounds rather than religious grounds. And I found out that uh, I could not make that case because a choice is involved about how to interpret Polanyi's epistemology. And he did not choose the theistic interpretation. He chose an agnostic, and, and it's very strong uh, in, in uh, um, personal knowledge. He follows uh, Tillich, and his theory of faith is that it's filled with doubt. Doubt is intrinsic, faith is intrinsically doubtful. And um, you can't, he, he says in personal knowledge, it's wrong to say that God exists. That's an inappropriate proposition. But it seems, you know, I don't want to get caught in the weeds. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> when he says those sorts of things, though, you can't help but wonder, is, is he talking about the sentence itself? Is he talking about its conclusion? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. Hard to say. It's hard to and, say. Polanyi's not known for trouble. his clarity. Ah. <laughs> uh... I don't maybe know. You push, maybe I don't, you push back on that, but I would. I don't know. Okay, because because I am profoundly moved by things that he wrote, and I say I could never say that. As am I. Yeah. How did he manage that? You know, and and I just stand in awe of his vision of reality and his ability to, com to c communicate that to me. I don't know if that's the kind of clarity we're talking about here. As a philosopher he was informal. He proceeded informally most of the time. And in his effort Which I to- I find charming, to be quite honest. Charming, yes. And he latched on to Tillich because he had never been trained in theology. He'd never uh, had a mentor in that field. And uh, so he followed Tillich. All right, not, not to my tastes, not, not to my, what I consider to be central. But the point is that 
for a long time, 1991, I did a book review. See, I, I, may, I must have been for tradition and discovery, I suppose, on Colin Waitman's doctoral dissertation. He's from down in Australia. And he made a very, a, to me, persuasive case that Polanyi was an atheist. And I've met atheists who agree with Colin Waitman, wonderful atheists. There's a guy up in Edinburgh who spent a, a whole day, a uh, charming man, pleasant, kindly, gentle, uh, Polanyian atheist. And uh, he's the man, I, I, I wrote an article quoting uh, a letter of his that uh, Polanyi is the man who fell among theologians. Mm. Because, because so many theologians, right, Richard Gelwick, you know, John F. Torrance, Sinsky. there's many. Yeah, Torrance, yeah, yeah. Uh, love Polanyi because- Leslie he, Newigan. Yeah. There's many. <laughs> he, he said, my philosophy is open to the world of religion and heals a breach between religion and science. And I expect a religious renaissance to spring forth from my philosophy. Well, that's a religious thought. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's that um, shape that's in Polanyi's thought that appealed to the uh, University of Aberdeen and, and the Gifford Lectureship, right? That he, yeah. he fit, there are parts of his thought that perfectly fit the field of natural theology. Now, when I was in my Polanyi is an atheist stage, I, I, was, I saw Marjorie Green, uh, an atheist, bellow out against Polanyi's pitiful efforts to be a theist at that Kent State Conference in 1991, the same one where Bill Scott gave the most wonderful summary of Polanyi's life, you know, at the wheel of the world. And I bought the theory that Polanyi was an atheist and that he only dragged God kicking and screaming into the book at the most unexpected points because he had to kind of pretend to be doing natural theology. And I, I really was, you know, held Polanyi in contempt for a long time. And it was only later letters of his, you know, things that I read later on, after the, the bi biography was long published, you know, when I was uh, preparing Bill's files, I was sending primary materials back to the Polanyi family. I was sending primary materials for Bill Scott's archive out to University of Nevada at Reno, you know, uh, trying, trying to make sure that I didn't die with anything uh, in my files that was the only copy in the world. And uh, so I read a lot more of the material that Bill collected. And I found this wonderful unpublished letter. Uh, it's not in the bibliography because, oh, it was a private letter, right? That's why. <laughs> uh, this is Golenlock. Golenlock sent this to Bill. It was a note from Polanyi to a Methodist minister whom Golenlock knew the minister gave the letter to Golenlock because Golenlock was a student and a devotee of Polanyi's. Golenlock sent it to Bill and Bill lost track of it. It's from 1947 and Polanyi is thanking this Methodist minister for his preaching. And Polanyi had gone every week to listen to this man preach and liked what he was hearing. And, uh, and, and the man has been taking a new assignment in another parish and Polanyi saying goodbye to him, hoping that they can stay in touch. And when I saw that, I said, well, 1947, I uh, may be wrong about the, the, the quality of Polanyi's Christianity. Hmm. And then I read letters to old him where, like I say, he's, he's writing from the heart and he's saying, God bless you. Oh, Joe, uh, as Polanyi was aging, his friends came to be, mean more to him. And he was very sentimental in his last letters with Joe, mm. telling how much, how much he appreciated him, you know, and, and uh, remember your old, old man, Michael, you know, and, 
other prayers, prayers that he offered to people who were grieving the death of a spouse. Uh, and, and, and Gelbuk always told me, Gelbuk hated the fact that I was um, holding Polanyi's Christianity in contempt. Mm. And he said, no, Marty, I was with him. And he told me that uh, we, we would sit and pray and, and meditate. And he said to me, it's so good to have someone to thank. Mm. You know, this is another one of those areas I'd I'd love to get caught up in the weeds because yes, it's me complicated. Too. It's complicated, right? Because you also hear from Prosh, who will say, "No, I I sat with him and I came away with a different conclusion." Of course, and you'll have Lady Drusilla Scott, who will say, "No, I sat with him. I came away with a different." You know what I'm yes. saying? So it, it, yes. Yes. I just wish it was cleaner. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, no, but that's Polanyi. He's like the residue in the bottom of the test tube. You got to live with, with the, you know, there's stuff about Polanyi that just doesn't, it's, it's not pure. And he didn't strive for that kind of purity. With the atheists, he brought out his atheist side. With agnostics, agnosticism. With scientists, his, his magnificent command of, of physics and chemistry, and not so much of biology, but, you know, physics and chemistry takes you a long way. And uh, with the theists, with the theologians, he was theological. I, I think it's an important part of Polanyi you have to come to grips with when you're when you deal with him. I think it's a matter of fact. Now, the final chapter of the book tries to grapple with this mystery of how much of a Christian was Polanyi at different times in his life. And there's contradictory evidence. He's saying to his fellow scientist working in Berlin, I'm going to Karlsruhe, I'm going to get my degree, and I want to fit in Germany. I want to see on my new Hungarian passport. Tell me what group I should have baptized me. I don't care. To any other, name, a, name a denomination, any denomination, I'll take it. He, didn't, he wasn't a convert to Christianity. At least not 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 the kind of convert that I want to have. Right. Not not caring who baptizes him. So he got baptized Catholic. All right. All right. Very proud of that. Polanyi is one of us. But nineteen twenty to fit in. To fit in to pass, and he falls in love with a Catholic woman, Magda, um, also a um, uh, student. A doctoral student in chemistry and uh proposes marriage to her and they're planning a catholic wedding and then her father dies and they said well now we don't have to have a catholic wedding and they went and got married in front of a justice of the peace which is not a very catholic thing to do <laughs> i just I just want to make that clear and yeah. they lived he lived and thought and taught protestant all of his life <laughs> protestantism for him was the ideal of a free association of free thinkers. It was the model of a society of explorers who have no pope, no council, no dogma, no I, catechism. I was going to say, he, he, is, he is critical of Catholicism at points. Yeah, no, 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 but a point. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm what do be, you mean? I'm trying to be kind here, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> he uses it as a whipping boy. <laughs> as... as Okay, so he, in, in um, geez, it science, faith, and society, he's got polycentrism and um, the um, fixed center, center. Polycentrism is science. Poly, the, the authority in science is distributed. Every scientist is his own judge of the quality of his work and the quality of right. other people's work in his field. So that's the polycentric model. The Catholic Church is used as the a model of a tyrant, of an autocrat, of a monarch, you know, of a dogmatic system where there is no, he thought, he thought, right. absolutely no freedom of thought. Yeah. So it's, it, it's the bad boy, the bad guy. <laughs> it, uh, he does see it as paradigmatic of what's happening yes, in science. Yes, yeah. oh, and, 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 and he and saw it. On, on the model of the Soviet Union right. and the, the planners of science. And we're not going to get into the weeds now. 
let's come in for a landing but, as we look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, yeah, I've got a defense of Catholicism because I didn't leave the Catholic Church. I'm just saying that. <laughs> I fully, I fully appreciate that. Despite my love of, and I love Polanyi. I love Polanyi. Love him so much. So anyway. Uh, let, let's just, let's end by talking about his death. How, when uh, how yeah. does, does he die? He lost the power to express himself coherently. Hmm. And I, I had to read the biography at least 20 times, I think. And every time I came to the end of the book, I was grieving. The man who gave us the theory of tacit knowing was locked up in the tacit dimension. So over the last 10 years of his life, he declined slowly at first and then precipitously after 72. And he was still, still lecturing, still writing, still hoping to write one more last grand work, I think on the scale of personal knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he, he couldn't do it by himself. He wanted to put together all of the things he'd been working on since the tacit dimension. So he wanted to synthesize his, his time in Chicago. He was back and forth to Chicago a lot in those years. And it's the stuff that turns up in meaning. Uh, among, uh, among other things, okay, and he and he made different lists of what he wanted to put into the book and how different uh, strategies for organization. And uh, his last years of letters are very, really, full of pathos. I, I don't want to say pathetic because that makes me think I'm looking down on him, but there, he was begging people to help him write a grand synthesis of his life's work. But ultimately, Prosh says yes. Well, Prosh was ready. Prosh had already written a book about Polanyi, I think. And uh, Prosh, uh, Phil and I worked on his obituary together for Tad. And I gathered together all of the letters. Had you ever uh, met him? No, no. But my heart goes out to him because Polanyi never wrote anything helpful to Prash. He would write words. He would say things. But they, they, he could not explain to Prash that in the end why he did not like what Prash had written. There was some distaste or revulsion with the way his thinking came out in Prash's version. Galwick says it's because of the treatment of religion. I say, I'll be damned if I know what it was. I honestly, I've, I've, I've read every scrap, I've read uh, letters from Prash to Scott, uh, I have I have as well. And the part that makes it kind of mysterious to me, at least, yeah. is that when you see that the book Meaning came from his Meaning lectures and you yes. go and read the lectures, anything that you would say, oh, they included this or tweak that about God or whatever, you're like, well, I, I don't know. I see that in the lectures. So Well, exactly. That was Prash's case. That's what Prash said. <sighs> and, uh, uh, okay. Okay, so we have this mystery. There's really, for me, a, a, the sadness. Poor Michael Polanyi, who had been so prophetic, who, whose early works, whose mature works have shaped my life, my way of thinking. He could not explain to a willing co-author what needed to be changed. And he couldn't write it himself. He could not write it himself. Yeah. And it was from one day to the next, you know, uh, one day Prosh went with the manuscript and sold it to Polanyi and got Polanyi to sign the contract. And Magda was outraged and she berated 
Prash for taking advantage of a sick old man. And Prash prevailed. They not, did not persuade her, but he had the contract. And I think he was morally justified in publishing the book. And we, have, we, we know Polanyi was depressed the day after he signed the contract. That's what made Magda and Gelwick upset. And I don't know exactly what it was that he wanted to be different. I, honestly, uh, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not, I, I just, and I, I feel sorry for Prash. I, I think you'd agree that one of the things he's, he's upset about at the end is that he really didn't want a co-author. He didn't want, he wanted to do it himself. I think that you can't help but feel, especially when you're reading the letters, that they want to make sure, and particularly Magda, that they just want to make sure that people know that this is his thinking, that that this is his work, and and I think they don't like that there's another oh, name attached to it. Oh, oh, no. Now, how does it read? Is it are they are they listed as co-authors, or is it Polanyi with Prosh? Or it's not Prosh alone, right? Oh, of course not. It's not Prosh alone. No, it's it's no. They're no. really they're from everything I've seen. They're co-authors. Yeah. Well, now, Galwick says he thought it was just the style. That... Well, uh, the style is definitely part of that, but the, I think that's yeah. a symptom of the fact that he's got to write. He needs help writing it. I, I don't think he ever just came to terms with the fact that he needed help writing it. He just, he really didn't want. He didn't want somebody. It's kind of like these are your ideas. You don't want somebody else to be associated with your ideas. At what level yeah. do you want that, right? Well, hey, we should probably wrap things up here. There's so much more that could be talked about. Yeah, and I have a yeah. feeling that we'll have to come back together and delve deeper into some of the weeds. This yeah. was this was an opportunity to kind of survey at, you know, at a bit of at, at a bit of a distance, but survey Polani. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, Marty, thank you so much for joining us on Pleasure. this edition of Tradition Discovery. Thank you, uh, if, Andy. If you would like uh, to to know more, uh, where would you send people if they want to if they want to read more of your writings or thoughts on Polanyi? I think uh, just about everything I've written I've written for Tradition and Discovery. There are the occasional articles in some other things, but uh, I think I'm careful to mention them in anything well, I write for Tradition and Discovery. Again, that so, the archive of that entire journal can be found on the PolaniSociety.org website. And it's all digital. It's all digital. And it's you can read every article from volume one, number one, yeah. to the one that's coming out next month. So it's, it's a great resource. It's, it's a tremendous you. resource. Yes. Point you there. Thank you again for joining yes. us. Pleasure. Great talking with you. Till next time. Okay.